Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And if you will, I hope you listen to me for a second because I want to tell you about a wine that can make waiting for dinner a pleasure. The wine is Petri California Sherry. Any evening, well, let's say tomorrow evening, right before dinner, pour yourself a glass of Petri Sherry. Just look at it. It's clear as crystal and a wonderful deep amber color. One sure sign of a good sherry. And if you need further proof of just how good Petri Sherry really is, taste it. What wine? A Petri Sherry has a flavor that you know comes right from the heart of the grape. And if you like your sherry dry rather than sweet, you'll really like Petri Pale Dry Sherry. There's no doubt about it. Petri Sherry is one of the most delicious before-dinner wines in this swell country of ours. Oh, and say, when you serve Petri Sherry, serve it proudly. Because those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the bottle, spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us. Let's go enjoy. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. All alone tonight, huh? Yes, my boy. If you can call a man alone when he's got his pipe, his books, and a glass of good port at his elbow. Take your coat off. You're full of enjoyment. Thanks, Doctor. Help yourself to the port. There's some rather special tobacco in the jar over there. Fine. And uh, now, Doctor, are you ready to tell us tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? I am, Mr. Bartell, and I think you'll find it a most unusual story. It began on a winter's night in 1896. Holmes and I had gone to a theater in the east end of London to see a performance of a famous old English melodrama called Sweeney Todd, the Demon Barmer of Fleet Street. That's a good bloodthirsty title, Doctor. Demon Barber. He sounds as though he specialized in close shaves. Good gracious me, Mr. Bartell, that, that's almost unforgivable. <laughs> he was a murderer of voracious appetite who placed his victims in a specially constructed barber's chair, cut their throats, and then pressed a lever that would swing the chair over and decamp the unfortunate victim into a horrible cellar beneath his shop. Well, this is only a stage play you're talking about, Doctor. As my story begins, we were seated in a private box watching one of the closing scenes. Holmes was leaning forward in his chair, following the action on the stage with an obvious delight. While I sat beside him, equally engrossed, an actor by the name of Mark Humphreys was playing the part of Sweeney Todd, and no one could deny that he was playing it up to the Where are you going, Tobias? To the nearest magistrate, Sweeney Todd. To denounce you as a fiendish, cruel, cold-blooded murderer. You have pronounced your doom. Into the chair with you. And over and down into the depths below. Ha, ha, ha. There. Tell me, whence comes this apparition? Tis the ghost of another customer of mine. The yawning grave yields up his ghastly inmates to prove me guilt. Blood will have blood. See, he is there. He comes to accuse me of his murder. Oh, save me! T'was not I that slew you. Let me leave, or it will kill me. Let me leave! Ah! <laughs> oh, upon my soul, Holmes, that fellow Mark Humphreys is the most florid actor. That I've ever seen on a stage. I find him enchanting, Watson. It seems to me he's really caught the flavor of this murderous monster piece. After all, a restrained performance for Barbara Sweeney Todd would be unthinkable. Yes, I suppose it would. But I must say, his makeup seems rather overdone. No barber would wear such an enormous beard. It'd be most impractical. Probably get in the customer's faces. By the way, um, I noticed from the program that Mark Humphreys, as well as being the principal actor, is also the owner of the company. Yes, the current trend towards the actor manager is a very healthy sign, I think. Come in. Excuse me, but is one of you gentlemen, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, I am. Oh, I was asked to give you this note. Thank you. Now, who on earth knows that you're at the theatre, Holmes? We'll soon find out. Ah, this note is from Mark Humphreys. 
Our actor manager. What's it, sir? Dear Mr. Holmes, I recognize you in your box. Please come to my dressing room after the performance. My sanity and even the safety of London, perhaps, depends on your compliance. Oh, my sanity and the safety of London. I wonder what on earth he means. That, my dear fellow, we can only discover by going backstage to meet him. As it is, the curtain's going up in the last scene I see. For a little longer, we must possess our souls in patience. Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir. Oh, my name is Lindsay, Derek Lindsay. I'm the business manager. Mr. Humphreys asked me to meet you at the stage door and take you to his dressing room. Oh, thank you very much. Now, this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Oh, Lindsay? how are you, Doctor? Oh, will you follow me, please? Excuse me asking, Mr. Lindsay, but surely you must be related to that distinguished actor of some years back, Lytton Lindsay. Oh, he was my father, Mr. Holmes. Ah, oh, indeed. The resemblance is extraordinary. With such a heritage, Mr. Lindsay, you must love the theatre. <laughs> It'll probably sound like heresy. But I hate it. <laughs> However, it's the only thing I was trained for, and there's good money to be made in it, sometimes. And money's the thing I both like and want. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I do hope you'll be able to help Mark Humphreys. He certainly needs it. Oh, really? What seems to be his trouble? He'll have to tell you that for himself. But his wife and I think... There's Mrs. Humphreys now. Maria! Yes, sir. Maria, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mrs. Mark Humphreys. How do you do? Oh, Mr. Holmes, I'm grateful that you're going to see Mark. He's in such a dreadful state. There have been times lately when, when Mr. Lindsay and I have been afraid he's going out of his mind, haven't we, dear? Uh, indeed we have. We're both dreadfully worried about it. In that case, I hope I can be of service. Which is his dressing room? Number one, next door to mine. Derek, I think it'll be better if Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson go in alone. I'm sure Mark will sit more freely if we're not in the room. I think perhaps that is a good idea, Mrs. Humphreys. We'll see you later on. Come on, girl. Come in, come in. Look, Thank heaven you're here. Close the door. Now, uh, Mr. Humphreys, uh, this is Dr. Watson. Watson, eh? Yes, I, I know of you, too. How do you do, sir? Sit down, won't you, gentlemen? You're wondering why I asked you to come back and see me, of course. Naturally, sir. Well, I won't beat about the bush and waste time. <coughs> I come straight to the point. I'm going mad. Oh, come on. I know, come, I know. Come, it come, sounds come. fantastic, but it's true. I've often heard of actors beginning to live their parts off the stage. That they play on it. Well, it's happened to me. I'm turning into another Sweeney Todd. The character I'm portraying on the stage. Are you suggesting, sir, that you're a potential murderer? Yes, I am. What reason do you have for holding that belief? Reason? Listen to this. Three times in the past week... I've wakened in the morning to find my boots covered with mud and my razor stained with blood. Good God. You've had no recollection of any untoward events during the night? None. Have you ever been addicted to the unfortunate habit of sleepwalking, sir? Not to my knowledge, Doctor. And if I had been, surely my wife would have told me about Your it. Your wife? Hmm. Uh, where do you live, Mr. Humphrey? We uh, have a flat here above the theatre. Above the theatre, eh? And Mr. Humphrey, you say that on three separate occasions on waking in the morning... You have found a blood-stained razor and mud-covered boots. Can you show us this proof? No. No, I can't. I was always so frightened that my wife would see that I... I cleaned them before she had the opportunity of finding them. It is, sir. They would have been very valuable clues in a case like this. I couldn't risk my wife seeing evidence like that. Doctor, she'd know the truth. But at night times, while she's asleep, some devilish, unconscious urge has overcome me. An urge that causes me to prowl the streets of London... Razor in hand, looking for a victim. Mr. Holmes, you've got to help me. I'm certain that without telling it, I've been committing murder, and if you don't help me, I'll go on and on. Shh, Mr. Humphreys, please. I'll undertake the case. It's a very unique assignment. In effect, I'm being engaged by a possible murderer to prove him guilty. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I've been through all the records we have here at Scotland Yard. You found it, Inspector Gregson. In the last two months, we haven't had one case of an unsolved killing with a razor. Any mysterious disappearances, Inspector? Oh, bless your heart, Doctor. There's never a day that passes without one or two of them. Here's a list of them, Mr. Holmes, if it's any use to you. Thanks. Come on, Watson. In the morning, we can go back to the theatre and set our friend's mind to oblige you, Gregson. Glad to be of service, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> We 
examined the homicide records at Scotland Yard after leaving you last night, Mr. Humphreys. There have been no unsolved razor murders in London during the past fortnight. And therefore, I think you may rest easy on that score, sir. But it proves nothing. Remember that in the play, Sweeney Todd's victims are never found yes, either. Yes, thanks to his singularly horrible ingenuity in disposing of them. But this is real life, Mr. Humphrey. Then how do you account for the bloodied razors and the muddied boots? Well, now, uh, are you sure that they aren't uh, just in your imagination, sir? You admit that your wife's never seen them? The whole thing could be, or shall we say, an overdose of <laughs> Sweeney Todd? Well, I admit that I'm suffering from a surfeit of that. And why not drop the play from your repertoire? Our manager, Derek Lindsay, won't let me... It's our best moneymaker, and he's always got a keen eye to business. Mr. Holmes, I can see that you still don't believe my story, so I've saved some evidence for you, evidence that I found this morning. Look at these. Now, what do you say? You still think it's my imagination? Got a blood-stained razor and boots covered with mud. Splendid. At last, some real clues to work on. How can you be so calm, Holmes? It happened again last night. Do you realize that I'm a murderer? I'm a menace to society. For heaven's sake, lock me up before I do some more no, damage. No, 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 sir. Don't get too excited. Mr. Humphreys, I should like to take these objects back to Baker Street where I can perform some chemical tests. You have no objections, I hope. Objections? Good heavens, no. Excellent. You've told no one of this fresh discovery of yours. No one. Not even Derek Lindsay. Derek Lindsay, that's your manager, isn't it? Yes. The best friend I ever had. Except for his father before him. It was Derek who helped me back on my feet two, two, yes, two years ago. When I put on that disastrous production of Macbeth, I don't know where I'd be today if it went for him. You lost a great deal of money on that production, sir. Nearly every penny I had. Indeed. By the way, uh, where is your wife, Mr. Humphrey? She's in her dressing room next door. We have a matinee today, you I know. I'd like a word with her. Uh, what's an old chap? Wait here for me, will you? I won't be a moment. Uh, right, sure, Holmes. Who is it? Sherlock Holmes. You want to talk to me, Mr. Holmes? For a moment. May I come in, Mrs. Humphreys? Well, couldn't we talk on the stage? It's empty. I prefer to come into your dressing room, if you don't mind. What I have to say is confidential. Very well, then. Come in. Mr. Holmes, may I introduce Signor Vanelli, our musical director? How do you do, sir? It is a great honor to meet the so great Signor Holmes. I have so admired you. Oh, often I have envied you. Many times I say to myself, Miss Nipsey... Uh, Signor Vanelli, if you don't mind, I wish to speak to Mrs. Humphreys alone. Oh, I quite understand. Excuse me, Signor. Adios, Mara Maria. Mr. Holmes, I'm really awfully glad of this opportunity to talk to you. Tell me truthfully, please, what's your opinion of my husband? I haven't formed a definite opinion yet. Except that it's possible that he's the victim of a fraud. I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Of course not, Mr. Holmes. Has your husband ever shown evidence of being a sleepwalker? A sleepwalker? Oh, no, never. I see. Are you a light sleeper? Yes, I am. Exceptionally so. I. Oh, just curious. You're being very mysterious, Mr. Holmes. Can't you tell even me what's going on? I promised your husband the answer to that question before tonight's performance. I'm afraid I can't tell you any more until then. Oh. And now may I ask a question? Oh, certainly. No, I won't promise to answer it. You said just now that my husband might be the victim of a fraud. What did you mean? Again, I'm afraid that you must wait for the specific answer to that question. However, there's another fraud being practiced on him that I can speak of now. What fraud? The fraud that you are indulging in, Mrs. Humphrey. Uh, what do you mean? Of course, this particular fraud is none of my business, but um, when I almost force my way into your dressing room and find your musical director... A plenty of rice powder on one shoulder and suggestions of rouge on his cheek. It doesn't take a great deal of intelligence to deduce that your husband is being deceived. Get out of here at once. That's exactly what I propose doing. Good day to you, madam. No doubt I shall see you later on. What does the microscope tell you about the mud on the boots and the blood stains on the razor? It's on a blank on the mud, old chap. It's an extremely common type that is found in most parts of London. And the blood? I'm examining that now. <laughs> this is the strange case as ever I remember, Holmes. Here you are trying to prove a man innocent when he insists that he's guilty. Why, George Watson! Here's the answer. What? This blood is definitely not human blood. It's probably canine. 
Now, a Sweeney Todd madness would hardly drive its victim to kill dogs. Therefore, it's obvious that Mark Humphreys is the victim of a devilish plot. And he's not a murderer. No, come on, old fellow. Let's go to the theater at once and give him the good news. The answer. Three quarters of an hour before the curtain time. Oh, it must be in his dressing room. I'll knock again. Ah, come on, Watson. Let's go in. Oh, look. Look, he's stumped over his dressing table. Oh, I hope we're not too late. Here, give me a hand with him. We are too late. His throat's been cut. Uh, poor devil. I promised him a solution to his troubles before the night was over. Little did I think that the solution would be death. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm going to ask you if you're one of those people who just eats to live, or whether you really enjoy good food. If you love good eating, you've just got to know about Petri wine. Petri wine makes good food taste wonderful. For instance, if you're having steak or a roast or any meat or meat dish... You'll love it served with Petri California Burgundy. Petri Burgundy is the last word in delicious red wine. Now with chicken or fish, you can't beat the delicate Petri California Sautern, a really extraordinary white wine. Just to make sure you don't miss either Petri wine, don't buy one, buy two. Buy both Petri Burgundy and Petri Sautern. They're both swell because they're both Petri. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? Well, I think I'll pick up the story exactly where I left off. Holmes and I were standing in Mark Humphrey's dressing room, looking with horror the flashed throat of the actor manager. There was a bitter, self-accusing note in Holmes's voice. I promised him a solution to his troubles before tonight was over. Little did I think that solution would be and death. This worry over his supposed madness caused him to commit suicide. Suicide rubbish, old fellow. It's murder. Look at the razor cuts in his hand. And that is placed there by the murderer before rigor mortis the chance to set in. In any case, scrutinize the wound. Does that look as if it had been done by the hand of a suicide? Oh, I don't see why not. Look close, old chap. The depth of the wound is even. That as a suicide cut always wavers towards the end. No, this is murder, Watson. And I think I know who did it. But I, uh, I have little evidence. I must lay a trap. What kind of a trap, Holmes? Huh? I have time to tell you now, fellow. Every moment counts. Off with you to Scotland Guard and get Inspector Gregson. Bring him back here as fast as you can. Right you are. And Watson. Yes? Tell absolutely no one except Gregson of Mark Humphrey's death. And say that he's still alive, well, and that his problems are solved. It's the performance of the play. Don't you worry about that, old chap. Off with you to Scotland Yard. I'm sorry it took so long to find me, Dr. Watson. I was out on another case, you Oh, see. that's all right, Inspector. But the performance, if there is one, must be nearly over by now. Here's the stage door, sir. Yeah, here we are. Here, here, you can't go on the stage. Who says I can't? I'm Inspector Gregson of Scotland Yard. Oh, sorry. The performance is going on. I wonder who the devil's playing with Sweeney Todd. Come along, come on. Let's just stand here in the wind. Quiet, the wind whistling through this cellar. This is impossible. <laughs> There's Mark Humphreys on the stage. I saw him with his throat cut. I don't believe in ghosts, Doctor. Great heavens, it, it's Holmes. Who's this? Ah, it's you, Mrs. Babbitt. Somebody seems to have cut your throat. What a pity. No more people find. Don't see me trying to cut your throat, dearie, and you'll cut their throat, too. <laughs> He'll revenge you while you burn down there in hell, dearie. He'll revenge you. <laughs> Here, here he comes, now, Gregson. Amazing disguise. I never recognized him. Thank heaven. But you're both here. Holmes, and what are you up to? Surely that's apparent. I disguised myself as the dead man, hoping to force the murderer's hand. You're running a terrible risk, Mr. Holmes. Out of my profession, Gregson. Shh, shh. Here comes Signor Vanelli, the musical director. Oh, my dear fellow, I had to leave the awkward to, to come and congratulate you. Never have you given a final performance. Bravissimo, bravissimo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But it is true. You hardly seem the same person. Your performance, she is incomparable. Keep it up, Mark. Keep it up. 
I think he spotted you, Holmes. Yes, sir. I didn't like his look as he said that. Well, whoever it is, they've got to the hand soon. Kurt, going up in the last scene. Keep your eyes open and suspect everyone. <laughs> Deny my guilt, but let the dead rise from their settlements to prove Sweeney Todd a murderer! By George, what an actor he'd have made, Doctor. Yes, yeah, what an actor he is, Gretchen. I'll be hanged if I know how he remembers the lines, though, even if he has seen the play half a dozen times. Here he comes now. Hello, Holmes. You did splendidly. But it didn't work, Watson. It didn't work, confound it. Murderer still hasn't tipped his hand. Have I underestimated him? Looks as if you have, sir. And if you don't mind my saying so, I think you'd have been a lot wiser to let me handle the case as soon as you found his body. Instead of going in for all this uh, dressing up stuff. Oh, but of course. Now I see it. Only one person could have killed Mark Humphreys. Who, Holmes? Do as I say and I'll show you. I'm going to Humphreys' dressing room now, alone. Give me a few moments, start, and then follow me. Out of sight, but within a shot. Dr. Watson, why does Mr. Holmes always have to be so blooming mysterious? Why can't he just say who the murderer is and take us to him? Well, I've been with Mr. Holmes on a great many cases, Gregson, and yet I can't answer that question. Come along. You've got a big enough start now. Let's follow him. I'm very fond of Mr. Holmes, you know, Doctor, and yet there are times when I get so angry with him, he shouldn't risk his life like that. Well, you know Mr. Holmes, he'll never change. And if he don't, one of these days he's going to wake up and find himself dead. That's the door. Someone inside with him. You devil, Listen. Humphreys! How many times do I have to kill you? Great Scottish Derek Lindsay, the business manager. Come along, Gregson. No, Lindsay! You succeeded in killing Humphreys, but you won't kill me. Grab his arm. Look out for that bracer. Here, you. Uh, let go of me. No, you don't. Uh, 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 very neat, Gregson. Are you all right, Holmes? Perfectly, thanks, old chap, though I'm a little tired. Uh, Gregson, my dear fellow, will you take over from here? I think I've had enough melodrama for one day. <laughs> Pleasant Watson to be back at Baker Street again, a crackling fire, my dressing gown, and your company combined to make a soothing ending to a somewhat violent day. It's been a most unusual case, Holmes. I still don't entirely understand it. The original thought, of course, was to try and drive Mark Humphreys mad by making him think that he's a murderer. That accounts for the boots and the bloodstained razor. Precisely, my dear fellow. And the killer, having conditioned his victim by this trickery, then murdered him, trying to make it appear a suicide. Now, who had a motive? Three people, Mrs. Humphreys, her lover, Signor Vanelli, and Derek Lindsay. I must say that I suspected the wife. Well, so did I for a while, and yet it was illogical. She knew, and we may therefore presume that her lover knew, and that I was suspicious of her. And she must have known that you promised her husband a solution to his troubles before the night was out. It seems highly improbable that she or Signor Vanelli would have faked his suicide at that point. Quite right, my dear fellow. So I investigated Derek Lindsay's affairs, and I found that what Humphreys had referred to as the kindly act of a friend in helping him back onto his feet was, in reality, the mortgaging of his entire theatrical effects. Lindsay stood to inherit the theater on Humphreys' death. Therefore, I was convinced that he was the killer. And then, after he'd murdered him, he saw what he thought to be Mark Humphreys on the stage. Ah, that's where I was slow and stupid, old chap. I couldn't imagine what motive gave the cold, clear nerve to suppress all reactions when he saw his supposed victim revived on the stage. Only at that moment did I realize. And what was the motive mm. that made him hold his hand? The characteristic that ruled his life, Watson. Avarice. A morbid love of money. You see, if he'd attacked me during the performance, he'd have had to refund the money to the audience. His greed conquered all other passions. It made him wait until the performance was finished before he attempted my life. You know, Holmes... Now that the case is solved, I'll tell you something in, in confidence. Please do, old fellow. What is At it? At the end of the play tonight, I was afraid that you'd uh, made a mistake, that you'd slipped up on the case. Uh, Gregson thought so, too. And, uh, I, Watson, will tell you something in confidence. Oh, what is it? 
<laughs> there were three of us that felt the same way. Now you're being modest, no? Oh, I assure you I'm not, my dear chap. In fact, in the future, if it should strike you that I'm, uh, well, getting a little overconfident of my powers, or uh, perhaps uh, giving less pains to a pace than it deserves, kindly whisper Queenie Todd in my ear, will you? I shall be infinitely obliged to you. <laughs> Doctor, that was a swell story. And, and a pretty narrow escape for Holmes. Yeah. He said he almost solved the case too late. But fortunately, it ended well. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that sticks in my mind is the fact that this was one of the very rare occasions when Holmes almost made a serious mistake. Well, we all make mistakes at times, don't we? Not till I said we, we all make mistakes at times. Mm, I suppose so. You mean to stand there and tell me that you never make a mistake? Well, not when it comes to choosing a wine, I don't, because I always choose Patrick. But, well, you tap me again. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. But honestly, Doctor, when you choose a Petri wine, you know it's a good wine. Because good wine is the only kind of wine the Petri family makes. And it's easy to understand why when you realize that ever since they started the Petri business back in the 1800s, the Petri family has handed on down from father to son, from father to son, the highly developed fine art of winemaking. Yes, the Petri family's been making wine for generations. That's why, no matter what type of wine you prefer, any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, do you care to give us a clue about next week's Sherlock Holmes well, adventure? Well, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, next week now. Yes, I'm going to tell you a colorful story that took place in the Parisian circus in 1890. It concerns a very exalted personage, the Lady Bareback Rider, and uh, a faint death that sucked that warning. Oh, boy, I, I can't miss that one, Doctor. Good. Well, now, before you go, I want to say something to all our friends. I want you just to think for a minute. Think of how terrible it is to see helpless little children stricken by infantile paralysis. And then realize that infantile paralysis can be beaten. It can be beaten in very many cases. And your money, your dimes, can do it. Join the March of Dimes. Send your dimes to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Let's help little children walk. Let's help them live. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher was suggested by an incident in this Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Yellow Face. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Cartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.